This show is brought to you by IndieWrestling.us. Check out IWC, RWA, and more. Click the Fight TV link on WrestlingMayhemShow.com to support this show and watch pro wrestling, MMA, boxing, and so much more. And listeners like you, support this show at Patreon.com slash WrestlingMayhemShow. Hey guys, it's the Indie Mayhem Show. Mike Sorg at Sorgatron on the Twitter here in the Mayhem Studios in Pittsburgh, PA. Uh, ready to talk uh, professional wrestling with you guys. It's a show about the love of wrestling and talking with people uh, all over the place. Not just indie wrestling these days, uh, but still the spirit of it uh, with uh, a lot of the interviews we have here. Check out this show and so many more on iTunes, Stitcher, Spreaker, iHeartRadio, and find the video versions on the YouTube and the Facebook page. And please support Wrestling Mayhem Show, WrestlingMayhemShow.com, Patreon.com, slash Wrestling Mayhem Show if you like the stuff we're doing. And we're doing something very special as of this recording over at Wrestling Mayhem Show, the Mayhem Mania. Uh, we call it the Patreon in the Bank, so you can uh, uh, take part in our little bit of a thought experiment around WrestleMania. Can we book a better WrestleMania than the WWE? I know everybody out there on the internet thinks so, and we strive to actually do it. Uh, so uh, please check out all the details on, and articles around that over at Wrestling Mayhem Show. Dot com. Uh, we have a first timer for the Indie Mayhem Show, but somebody who has been on Wrestling Mayhem Show from way, way back in 2011. He is a former writer, producer, everything for for just about every major promotion. Uh, he is Dave Lagana. Join us again here on the line. Thank you for joining us. Hello there. Hi. Good to see you. It's been uh, it's been a long time. I actually found that podcast sometime in the last six months. Just you know, looking on YouTube, it popped up. I'm like, oh my God, this was forever ago. And and <laughs> like we were talking about, I think it was, um, was it, I think it was the 10th anniversary or 9th anniversary show of Ring of Honor, which they have their 15th this right, week. So. Right. Absolutely. So, so around the same time period, it seems so. Uh, is yeah. It, that pre WrestleMania, we got We got to get you in, huh? <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, it's always a time people actually really enjoy talking about wrestling. Uh, I think they do the rest of the year, but it's, it's when sort of casual people come back. Oh, absolutely. Uh, well on this show, we, do, we like to have a little bit of an icebreaker for people who maybe don't know who you are. Um, and we like to start with like, how, what is your first kind of memory of pro wrestling or getting into it? Sure. Uh, so, we got cable in like 83 or 84, but I don't remember um, watching wrestling before 1985. It was actually my birthday in September of 85. I remember it was, uh, I think it was a wrestling challenge or superstars and uh, Barry Windham and Mike Rotunda were fighting the dream team, Brutus Beefcake and Greg the Hammer Valentine. And uh, it's like 10 o'clock in the morning or 11 o'clock in the morning. And I see a man take a cigar and shove it in another man's eye in a professional sporting event. And I, you know, I grew up a Philly sports fan, so we're used to things like that, but just not on the field. So, uh, it was kind of insane. And then I kind of looked around like, are my parents around? I'm just watched a man get maim maim on television and they weren't. So, uh, since then I've ever really enjoyed it. And, you know, the story of these dastardly heels doing something to win tag team gold and, and, you know, a tag team I liked, like the British Bulldogs trying to take it from them was an interesting first jump into storytelling. So, so, so a little bit of inspiration from that. And of course you've done this stuff, you know, not just around wrestling or anything like that. Uh, but, but, uh, and, 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 you know, was it always a goal to kind of like tell those stories? Um, I'm not sure. It's kind of weird. Like you don't, um, you don't really like people don't really verbalize why they like wrestling. You get a group of people together and I always ask the question, all right, what age did you find it? And if they found it 11 or 12 and South, they usually are lifelong fans. They come in. Usually the people that come in and out found it sort of when they were 15 or older, mm. uh, cause they don't really understand it, but it's also the same people are the same way about cars. You know, it used to be baseball cards, but nobody collects those anymore. Um, uh, you know, comic books, but look at, look at the resurgence comic books have had. And from that sort of same generation, mm -hmm. um, that's why Pokemon, I think is having a, a comeback because it was like, it got big in like 93 or 94, or 95. Uh, and they had that movie. So like, like things have these generational comebacks and, uh, it's, it's why it comes back around, but yeah, it's, it's just an interesting approach. Absolutely. Um, and, 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 you know, kind of go into the story, you know, skip a little bit here. Last time we had you on the show, I know we talked a little bit about, um, you know, kind of the creativity, right. And a little bit more, mm 
uh, uh, kind of growing out of like the, the, I don't know, siloed kind of WWE kind of idea with it that I know you experienced it, you know, and, and I think it's really cool on this show. We get to see a lot of the guys, you know, on the indies in other promotions kind of stretch their wings creatively a bit more. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. yeah, it's, it's changed a lot. I mean, it hasn't, it hasn't, you know, since we last talked in 2011, you know, before, when we last talked, you know, think about it. TNA was TNA. I hadn't worked there yet. Ring of Honor was still owned by Carrie Silkin. Sinclair hadn't bought it. You know, WWE in 2011, think about that mania. The main event was John Cena versus The Miz with The Rock coming back, right? I mean, so like The Rock hadn't even wrestled. And now it's just like you couldn't even fathom that idea that The Rock would ever come back. So th- things change very rapidly. I mean, The Rock wasn't on social media. Actually, I think he had just gotten on um, at that period. Um through a friend of mine now, Amy Joe Martin actually got him on and he's done a, a little well. So, uh, with what he's doing, but, but the level of creativity hasn't changed. I think people just mentality is almost stuck in 2011. Some people's mentalities are stuck in 2011. Some are stuck in 2009 and some are stuck all the way back in 2005. I've met very few people in the wrestling business who were actually in 2017. Wow. And, you know, um, it's disappointing. And, you know, there's a the, you doing this show. I'm sure has changed a lot in the the years you've done it. But I'm sure there's a lot of stuff you wish you could do. But you know, you, we couldn't broadcast this interview on Facebook six years ago. Right. And you know, it, it, there's articles all the time. I, I don't really tweet out. Oh, they should book this guy better. I, I tweet a lot of stuff of technology moving forward. And you know, Facebook is primed to become your all in everything, including your cable provider within the next three years. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, and you see a lot of at least like the younger guys kind of take advantage. They have to make their own name. Um, I mean, I remember probably around when we when we talked to you it was when, when like Johnny Gargano was doing like a web show on a webcam. Right. And now it yep. seems like everybody was doing it. And look, look where he is now. Right. It was it was it was mm-hmm. something to kind of stretch out and get get a foot in the door. And I think we talked about it. You know, if you're not on Twitter, if you're not on YouTube and now it adds on to all these technologies that we have today. Um, that Yeah. Be, and it's that, it, it all tweaks. Easier. I mean, it all. Yeah. Well, it, it does make it easier, but also you have to really attack it hard. And, you know, there's a real, we're almost, you know, people talk about the attitude era and I don't even know what, what do they call like the Cena era? I don't even know what it's called. You know, the Daniel Bryan era, was it called the reality era? Like, yeah. I don't think we're, I think people still are more interested and I'm not saying this in a Vince Russo, like what's going on behind the curtain, but I'm, what's really actually going on behind the curtain of the person. And I think, you know, if you can meld a character that is really you and really you in, in all forms, you know, like I was listening to Eli Drake on Cabana podcast and he had a really interesting point of, you know, when he's not wrestling, he's Sean Ricker, you know, but Eli Drake is pretty close to Sean Ricker. So when, where does, where's the line end and how do you present yourself? And, you know, there was this old form of music and Billy Corgan and I talked about this recently where, um, you know, in the old days when you had an album, you would, you know, come out of the hole to promote it and then go back in the hole after. And what he's trying to do, and I think what a lot of people have to understand is, is now that everybody is sharing everything about their life all the time, and I'm talking Snapchat generation where, you know, people are literally communicating this way. If you're not communicating that way, you're, you're going to miss out because that's why there are people with 3 million followers on Instagram who you've never heard of because they figured out how to entertain a group of people um, in ways that, you know, there are cats that have 4 million followers on Instagram and, you know, a pro wrestler will have 30,000 to 70,000. Why? They've learned how to hack a system. And by Mm -hmm. the way, I'm no expert at it, but I'm willing to look at it and go, okay, there's a lot of interesting things happening in this space. And, you know, broadcasting a 52 week a year pro wrestling show is just one element of branding yourself nowadays. Absolutely. And you say, we, we, we've definitely seen that with what a lot of these guys have done. Uh, they, you know, very specifically, I think the Hardys kind of look at something that, that, you know, created something very different. Right. Yes. And then I don't know what hand you might've had in that in, in your time there. Uh, but, but, you know, it was definitely, it's not something in a studio. It's not something that's wrestling in the traditional sense. They got to really kind of reach outside the box on something like that. And, and they continue that with social media and, and kind of uh, different channels, I guess, these days. Yeah, yeah and, and, you know, Matt and Jeff, you know, when I, last time I spoke to Matt, I was like, I said, you guys were ahead of the curve, and I don't remember what year they were doing the Hardy show. Mm-hmm. You know, they were early, 
you know what I mean? And I think I think they had it on a subscription service. I don't really remember, but you know that kind of content creation and also it's understanding like okay if you do a web show and nobody watches it okay how can we get more people to watch it or how do we how do we create content so like i just told this story on a solo monsters podcast you know in the matt hardy story it was a very fluid situation i mean you know there was a point that we were going to pull the plug on it because before the contract signing we were like oh, he's really dark you know the accent's weird you know it hadn't really fully aired so, you know, they went and killed it. But I remember after Slammiversary, you know, we had two different versions of what we were going to do. We had originally talked about bringing back the Big Money Matt character before, obviously, the explosion of the, you know, the contract signing and what people were up to before the final deletion. Um, and then, you know, at Slammiversary, I remember telling Matt, I was like, I'd love to see you do a Facebook live stream all night of you know, you just laying awake so angry that your brother beat you and what that character could do for nine straight hours. Now, obviously he didn't do nine straight hours, <laughs> but he, he did 10 minutes and the 10 minutes are fascinating. And that's where I mean is you can experiment and you go, oh, well, everybody knows it's fake. Cool. Well, that's great. But when you separate, you know, everybody knows that that, that wrestling is fake, I guess. But yet they all bought into Matt Hardy's character because it took him on a journey and you forgot for a minute. Mm-hmm. So use the medium to to tell that. Absolutely, and and, and I think there's there's definitely you know we're seeing with Lucha Underground and of course you know fans that love Chikara like love that kind of detachment of reality a bit too, mm-hmm. right? Uh, it's like yeah, we're, and, we we're going on the journey together at this point. Yeah, and I think that's it's fine, and and you know movies are fake, TV's fake. There's fake news, mm-hmm. you know. There's um, you just. As long as it's good and entertaining, like I watch local news and I'm like, God, this isn't for me. But it's not for me. It's for a 50 year old generation that literally doesn't get their news from anything but local news. Mm-hmm. And once you accept that, there's no, I don't think there's anything local news can do to get a younger generation. Just not going to happen. They have to be in the places that the younger generation is. And that's why there's like the proliferation of sites like Vice and sites that are telling stories to people like that. That's why the traditional wrestling show is going to have an audience, but just like all of television ratings will tick down, you know, as, as people watch content differently. We, we met with a, a company that did market research. They say kids under the age of 11 don't watch television. Now you go, Oh, well some, yes, some do, but the prevailing trend of people that have phones, they're getting everything they're doing, you know, from their phone media wise. And, you know, and, and parents say to kids, Oh, you need to get off your phone. But that's like, that's like telling a, you know, I don't, uh, our age difference. I remember I had my own phone in 1989, 1991 to talk to my friends. It's just, it's where the way things are going to communicate. And I think you have to be communicating on those levels. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, it, it's definitely going to be a lot different. Um, I want to talk a little bit about a project that not, not quite wrestling related, but I, I'm fascinated just as a media person. And we've had conversations about this um, on the yep. side as well. But I want to talk a little bit about uh, after you left TNA, uh, you, you went on the road. <laughs> a bit yeah, um, it, it, it was great it was great because we're, 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 we're chatting around new year's and you're and we were talking about coming back and you're like oh yeah i gotta go on the road with billy and i was like billy oh billy corgan you know uh yeah. so tell me a little bit about this 30 days project i watched a lot of it it was really i was showing my wife it i'm like you gotta watch this stuff uh because she's an old smashing pumpkins fan as well um and it was it was really intriguing again you're using a lot of mobile technology there's a lot of periscope facebook live uh, uh stuff going on there can you talk a little bit about that project how it came about and kind of how it unfolded yeah it um it's funny because we um you know billy and i are not shy about wanting to get back into wrestling but you know we've had very deep discussions over where the business is at right now and it's funny every every week or weekend things pivot and sort of show us that we're sort of right on which way it's going um, so before we got back in or get back in, you know, we wanted to play around in the, in the, the area that we want to play in. So he, um, he had done this trip, uh, before last year, uh, the same idea, travel around. He did some, he did some, uh, Facebook posts, Twitter posts and all that stuff. And he, what he wanted to do was amp it up. And so, you know, I think you and I talk about my adoration of a man by the name of Gary Varnerchuk, who last year decided to have a guy by the name of D-Rock follow him around for every day to, you know, make a a daily video vlog. And a lot of people make them, but 
he put a really high quality aspect to his vlog. That's, I mean, if it aired on television, you wouldn't, you wouldn't blink an eye on this. So that was sort of the goal. You know, we went for a very raw approach that, but though it still could air on television as far as storytelling and narrative, you know, like, you know, I, we met a couple people on the road who were doing vlogs and I'm like, God, they're just, they're just so basic and, and, and good. But like, I was like, I got to push myself to do more. So it was just me and him and this guy, Josephus Hudson. Um, he wrestles. He was there. He was a character in some of the episodes. Uh, and, you know, we would go out and and create content. And I think that's the thing is it's not about creating content. It's documenting what we're doing. And, you know, if you watched it, you could kind of really see what, you know, Billy was hoping to do. And, and I my eyes were open to a part of America that I didn't know existed. And, you know, he got a lot of inspiration on the last trip. It's actually the album that he has coming out later this year that he did with Rick Rubin, you know, that, that this kind of America exists. And we're sitting here arguing over Dolph Ziggler pushes, like get out in America for a minute. And, and then more for people that are in the business, like you travel every week, find interesting stories. And, you know, guys like Ethan Page are out there, you know, doing vlogs every week, you know, about their trips. And, and Kevin Steen did one and, you know, uh, in the past, like, there's a lot of really interesting stuff, but you have to remember, you have to put a little bit of story into it. And that's the business you're in and, and have fun with it. So that sort of was the jumping off point for that series. That's great. It, it was, and you know, it, it's, uh, you're on the road in an RV with the equipment on you. I know, I know I saw tweets of, uh, we didn't think we we're going to get an episode out today. Like, I mean, it's kind of mm-hmm. an adventure in itself. Like, like just every day putting it together, right? Every, every day, like, like the, the gimmick, using that word the gimmick of it was uh i learned very quickly that billy was deciding where we're going i gave him like some suggestions and he was like okay no no uh every morning he'd decide where we'd go so you know my production process was you know we would finish a day i would dump all the footage into a a folder you know here's the day's footage i'd separate it out by you know camera or uh, things and then i'd get in the rv and start chunking it out finding the story all at the same time, whenever we would get somewhere, stopping and shooting the next day. So when people would ask me, what'd you do today? I'm like, can I tell you tomorrow when I'm editing it? Because I have no idea what I'm actually doing right now because I'm in li- literally living in three different days, um, you know, like of, of stuff. So like it was almost this weird, just kind of get through it. But there were moments where I was like, there's nothing here. There's literally no story here. And then I'd find a quote. I think the it's actually one of my fa- favorite ones called Lost But Found. Uh, it's kind of very underrated of the group, but you know, Billy, we found this moment of light and then literally it did not look like it to the naked eye, but this is great purple sky. And he's like, I got a line for you. So he gave me this little lyrical thing he was working on, but lost, but found. And it all tied together all the stuff we did that day. Like we went to this horrible dinosaur museum somewhere in Texas. I mean, it was like, it was fine. It was a local museum, but like, you know, it was, it was, that's where the term dino disappointed came from. And then we ended up in Corrigan, Texas, which is actually the spelling of his family's name originally when he came over. And then, you know, we ended up wandering around this town in Texas, you know, literally got lost trying to find the cemetery and it all sort of tied together. And it was interesting because the line he had said was before we got lost again. So it was just sort of like the episode came together and, you know, well, I had somebody reach out. Well, how did you monetize it? What was the point of it? There's not a point. It's 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 entertaining somebody in the day. And you know, music is not uncommercialized music. The pure root of why a song is written and the sound of it is not to make money. It's to uh, give an emotion and document a portion of somebody's life. And that's what we were trying to do. And if you're trying to sell to somebody all the time, you're just going to end up losing them because you sell to them all the time. If I kept calling you, Hey, Hey, can you lend me 10 bucks? Can you lend me 10 bucks? Can you lend me 10 bucks at about the second time you're going to be tired of me asking for the $10. It's kind of like we get um, a little fatigued with, with their wrestling promotion, say, you know, saying, Hey, make sure you subscribe to this, do this, buy this, you know? Um, but they're not giving us content we care about in the meantime. It's, it's uh, it, Gary V talks about it and I will talk about him a lot because not- I, um, you know, I've read all his books, but it wasn't until last year and it was was a lot of the pivot point of, you know, where I sat in impact and, you know, my, my relationship with Matt Conway and Billy, you know, last year sucked business wise. Mm -hmm. So, okay, what can we do? 
we can do this best show possible. And every talent we worked with, you know, what can we do to make it work? So Gary does this thing, a book called Jab, 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 Right Hook, where you, you give, 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 and then you ask. You don't demand. And, you know, wrestling, it's, you know, the pay-per-views, and thirteen ninety nine, and that's fine. You, that's your ask. But you have to do it in a way that doesn't make it seem like you want their money. You want their attention. And, you know, that's the stuff that... That's why we're doing this, you know, like for five, six years, I didn't do interviews and it's not, it's not because, well, one, I wasn't really allowed to, they didn't really, and it's fine. I didn't want to at the time, but it's why I'm not sitting here telling you stories about, oh, that time that aces and eights did this because that's, there's value to that. But to me, there's a lot more value in connecting one-to-one with somebody, um, you know, and, and, and showing them they have a lot more power in their hands than they think they do. And I work with a lot of people that people don't know as far as like spending quality time going, Hey, you should try this. You should try this. And I have no financial benefit in it, but I know going forward, it actually will help me. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, big, of course, we've discussed big Gary V uh, uh, fan as well. Kind of what's led to a lot of what we do around here, uh, around these parts as well. So that's great. Um, yeah, it's uh, like he, if you, if you haven't checked him out, he produces a ton of content. It's actually overwhelming. But oh, yes. what's good about him is it's it, he's got basically five ideas that he rotates, and I'm sure there's more than five. But like, you know, it's 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 really a great thing, and he does a lot of interesting stuff. And you know, he's authentic. You know, mm-hmm. I've met him, and and you know, it was you know, Billy and I went to meet with him in September, and it was the best meeting of my life only from the pure fact of understanding his, his process and understanding what really, really is going on there. And, and by the way, he's very authentic in showing what's going on. And I think a lot of people, and this is a, this is a knock on pro wrestling. They're afraid to show what's really going on warts and all. Mm -hmm. And for what reason people wrestling fans have been through the worst We've, you know, you've, you've lived through the deaths of wrestlers you like, you, you, you get disappointed and yet they still stay. So being a little bit more honest and authentic, and trust me, I understand protecting kayfabe and all that stuff, but really to me, the thing that needs the most protecting is the finish, meaning what's the end of the story. And nothing drives me more insane. Like, you know, this whole WrestleMania build has been sort of narrowed to me because everybody knew the finish, meaning they knew everything that was leading up to it. So there's no surprise. And I don't understand why people, one, release that information. And I know people are like, oh, weren't you a leak? No, it wasn't. I, I always, always believed in protecting the information that delighted an audience. And anybody that spends their time uh, pushing this is what's going to happen, which is cool, great, you're in the know, but you're hurting an audience. And if you seek that out, great. But I, it's like to me, that's the thing that needs the most protecting. You know, the context that goes around stuff I think is important, you know, like the wise after the fact that's why documentaries are so good things after the fact it's a great story but before the fact now you've you've taken the joy and the, and the power out of the artist's hands and i think that's something that's disappointing that's going on in the business absolutely as a conversation we have a lot on on our on our raw rapids and some of the other shows yeah we we get there why are we even going through the next four weeks we kind of joked about it even last night on the show um on the on the post uh, uh fast lane episode right um but uh but you know wrestling fans we're going to stick with it so you know why why not expand a little bit right so. yeah well it's just and, and if everybody's doing the same thing mm-hmm. i mean literally it's you know and, and you know I, I check out a lot of independent and mostly I, I check out a lot of talents and what they do and that's where i say they're sort of stuck in 2011 like 2011 twitter peaked and you right. know that's a lot of what i learned and, and then I got off of it. You know, I mean, I was still on it, but I wasn't, you know, using it every day. And, and I think podcasts have peaked. And I don't mean that in any disregard to anybody that's doing great podcasts. It's just too much content. Think about it. I'd, I'd like somebody to figure out a, um, like somebody to like literally count the number of just even, uh, I hate to use the word top line, but like star driven podcasts that are out there and hours of content that get created every week. At some point you got to, you got to do something else and yeah. there's only so much time in the week. That's where everything gets behind. So, you know, so instead of a three hour podcast or a one hour podcast, can you create a piece of content that's two minutes? Can you create a piece of, uh, can you create a, a, an impactful moment? That's why some of the Billy stuff was two minutes, three minutes. He's like, if it's not there, don't force it. So that's why there's an episode where we're driving. Cause guess what? That's what we did all day. And there was no making it interesting beyond 
the visuals that day. That was the craziest day of driving because we saw all this different stuff. So that's what I mean is, is you kind of have to go with the story of the day. And, and the past is important. And, you know, he talks a lot about his past and, you know, he's well known from things he's done in the 90s. But his writing is actually better now as far as lyrics and because his experiences are better. And that's why the music he is coming out now is is based around his experiences now. Just like mine, I'll stack up 2016, you know, the writing that Matt Conway and I did in 2016 on Impact is the best year of wrestling writing I ever did. Mm-hmm. And uh, granted, I did a lot of really good stuff in 02, 03, but I was 26, 27 then. And life is a lot different now than it was 15 years ago. Absolutely. And it really is, um, you know, kind of on the podcasting side, like I say the same thing about YouTube. You can't be, you know, all those people, you know, like we we, we got a lot of our headway because we were one of the first wrestling podcasts. Right. And you start a wrestling podcast, period. Now you're in you're swimming in all that. You start a I want to do a video blog thing now, just a person with a webcam it's really got to be a lot of what's going to make it different. And, and, you know, mm-hmm. that applies to the wrestlers out there too. Like you're swimming in a sea of, uh, how many indie wrestlers that all have access to the same tools you do, what's going to make you stick out. So, well, that's where creat- creativity is it, you know, yep. talent. Yep. Um, you know, that's, you know, Ethan page is doing a very funny vlog every week. You know, I, I you know, I've talked to Cabana. I feel like Cabana should be doing one. You know, but he's so busy with his podcast and that's that's working for him. And so that's great. You know, do that. And somebody should be on Musical.ly. If they're if they're a, a funny uh, if they can make funny lip sync videos, because guess what? That's where that's where attention's at. You know, Snapchat. You know, I follow I follow a bunch of wrestlers on Snapchat. And I mean, I can't tell you if anybody's doing Snapchat right or wrong because there's no visual visual metrics of it. But you know, it's being there. Like there's, a, I don't know if you this thing anchor anchor pivoted today. I haven't really kind of dove into what it is. And everyone's like, when are you going to talk about Dolph Ziggler? Uh, I'm talking about anchor <laughs> because it's a, it's a, and I hope I drive off people that are only like, like I've been doing a lot of experimenting with Twitter going, you know, all right, if you're a creative person, reach out. And I've been sort of shocked by what people reach out about. Like, like in a good and a bad way, like, like, one guy's like, well, how can I help you? It's like, what one piece of content do you have that will blow my mind? And they're like, well, I have this, this, this. I said, one, send me one. One thing that you would say, this is the reason we should work together. And that's the thing is, is, you know, you have to find the one thing you're really good at before you can be good at a hundred things. Absolutely. Absolutely. There's, it's time for experiment, but there's also time for this is the thing to move forward. So... Um, like somebody just asked me on Instagram, who do you think the hottest free agent is out right now? I said, and, and you know, this guy follows me. It's team lean on my Instagram. It, the hottest free agent is the one that causes the biggest stir that's not signed. And so I ask everybody else, who do you think it is? Who? And it's not just, and I, I love matches. I don't want people to think I don't like matches, but you know, what's the, what's the, What's the sound between the notes? You know what I mean? What's the, what's the, what's the meaning between it? So like, what are you really getting out of somebody's journey? Like what's the greatest story that's being told right now independently? Like seriously, like you have all the authorship in the world. You know, that's where I gave uh, Generico and Steen such, you know, they were very heavily involved in the creative of their story in 2010. And it was a great story. Um, and this is the, Oh, okay. Yes. Uh, Kevin Condren is out there telling a story. Uh, if you've seen him on, uh, on um, championship wrestling from Hollywood. He just raised his hand on my Instagram. <laughs> so yes, you're doing it right. So, and that's what I mean is, is so, so that, that's where I think people have things in their hands. And I, I will only say this once every time I see a poster that has a wrestler and 19 other people on it promoting a show. And that's the only way you're promoting your appearance. You're doing it wrong. Absolutely. Well, speaking of that, so, you know, you mentioned a couple of names, but generally, like, what are you watching these days? Uh, you know, whether it be product or, or just individuals that are catching your attention otherwise. So I took a, um, let's see, January 9th, I went to Billy's house, or January 8th or 9th, I don't remember the day. We watched the Undertaker segment on Raw. And then up until Sunday, I did not watch any pro wrestling. I did not. I did not watch any. Like, oh, let me just take take that back. I did not watch a, a broadcast pro wrestling show. You know, I'll check out a clip or like a GIF or something of what's going on, and I followed. I read everything that's going on, but I took a break from it 
just simply because format wise, it was nothing appealing. Like Billy and I were actually in San Antonio the day of NXT and, and of the Royal Rumble. And I said, do you want to go? And we both went, we're good for right now. And it's not that we didn't want to go. It's just, you know, we were expanding to something else, but as far as who's doing things right, I, I, you know, I don't want to, uh, it's, it's hard. I don't want to just single one person out. I think the people that are doing it right are connecting with an audience and not only making money, but making connections that make them, it, when you when you go to an independent show, if you're a wrestler, and people travel 20 minutes, two hours, four hours to see you wrestle, that is a success because you've done something. Uh, so to me, the people that are doing it right are the ones that are actually causing business shifting changes for promoters who are spending the money. And I'm, trust me, I don't, I don't know a lot about sort of the indie promoters are out there, and they're probably good and bad. And, you know... To me, if you're an independent wrestler and you're hired for $400 to wrestle for somebody, you need to provide $1,200 of value because you need to, the, the cost of bringing somebody in, if they just break even, that's not going to help somebody. So you have to kind of look at it that way. What am I doing that's going to bring three times the value to that promoter? And the same way to the promoter. How if I, you know, bring this wrestler in, am I going to provide for him so that I can pay him the next time the same or more? I think that's the value proposition people need to give each other when they do wrestling. So, Awesome. Um, and I'll uh, modify this other usual question for this. Uh, what's kind of the best and the worst thing about making uh, content around pro wrestling? Surprise and delight. You know, so, and it, it was very frustrating. Like, so, so Matt Conway and I got thrown together in February of 2012. Um, and we... Uh, I, I, I literally knew nothing about him, you know, I, I like, so what we decided was, you know, what's the show we want to watch. And, you know, you, you, you hear a lot of people like, like triple H was a huge fan of Crockett television in the eighties. Like we had many discussions. We used to get along about it because, you know, some people were attitude era, but that was what he grew up on. You know, I grew up on Crockett, you know, I grew up on WWF, I grew up on world class and, UWF and all those promotions. So the show that I like and, and, and created content around was the one that was closest to the things that used to excite me. So the story of the cigar in the eye, you know, I wanted to do that same angle with Shaniqua and Basham brothers. That's why she had a cigar, you know, and I never got to do it, but it's like, and, and Oh, you gotta, you know, Cornette used to always talk about, he's got a, you know, his bag of tricks of, you know, I can do that angle in eight years. And it's not that it's just, you know, what are moments that can really happen on a television show that you didn't think were going to happen? So mm -hmm. people complain about what's going on on Raw. Oh, I know that was going to happen. Yeah, because someone told you it was going to happen. You know, the, the, the best part of story is thinking something's going to happen. But when you're told by somebody on the outside, oh, this is what's going to happen. And then you watch it and it happens. Of course, you know it. It's like, all right, guys, the, in the, in the, and when you go see Empire Strikes Back, they're going to let you know who Luke's father is. And it's this person. Yeah. It kills that moment. And like that's to me the singular most important thing in creating content is how do you take the audience on a journey and then at the right possible point pivot. That, that's been the biggest thing because I, I mean the spoilers, you know, discussion, especially around things that tape like Impact Ring of Honor. It, it's, uh, you know, it's like, you know, guys, I, you know, we, we know, you know, try not to find out who's going to win the belt here that you're going to find out in four yeah. months or four weeks or something like that. Cause I mean, I think that that colors your perception of a show like that regardless. And you're not able to kind of sit back and go for the ride that, that, that story trial is trying to, to trying to, uh, yeah. And, and, and that was our approach in 20 when Adam Pierce and I were doing ring of honor. So, you know, we knew what the problem we had was. Okay, so HDNet wanted to take six episodes at a time. Oh, yeah. Okay. Those are marathons. So, so yeah, and, and we did them. We did three one hours over two nights each. Each night we did three hours. But he also was booking shows around, um, you know, that would happen in the middle of those tapings. So, like, for example, like Austin Aries won the title sometime, I think, in 09 in June. So we shot segments that allowed us to edit around it. So like he would lay out uh, Jerry Lynn with the belt and then hold it and cut a promo. Now you, if once you sort of figured out the, the, the secret sauce of how it worked, but even that we would, we would mess with the format a little bit. It's, you have to create around a narrative that you want to tell, but also building the live event, live moments. So, 
you know, so when we would do impact Conway and I, like we would, okay, we know we have a live show on this date. Like even this past summer, like, um, it was Eddie Edwards and, and Lashley. Like we knew we were going to do something. And that was sort of the recruitment of mute moose because we wanted to have something happen on a live show that you may have heard was going to happen, but not know how it was going to happen and pivot story that way. And that's, that's sort of what you can do when you work in an environment. If you're producing live shows week to week, like raw, like there, there's a chance to really work the week to get people interested in stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Some opportunities there. Uh, so what is in the future? You, you, you kind of poked at, you know, what, what are you going to do with wrestling and stuff? Is there anything uh, you can hint at even at this point or, or even anything out of wrestling that's kind of on your purview for, for the near future? Um, so what, I've been doing and it's, it's been that one-to-one, um, thing. So like, you know, Billy, uh, a week from now, I'll be somewhere in the middle of New Mexico on a train with Billy Corrigan celebrating his 50th birthday. And, you know, we, you know, we've had a lot of discussions on what that project will look like. We don't want to do the same thing we just did, meaning, Mm -hmm. all right, every day, here's a new video. So there will be social elements that happen over his birthday that, you know, we're working with his new management team with. But what we're we're looking to create is a solid piece of content that comes out that shows not only it's his birthday, like every like everybody has birthday parties, but what do you learn when you turn fifty? And so like that's what we'll be doing for that. And you'll be like, oh, what's the point? The point is is to give you a deeper understanding of an artist and a story that you have involved in. So like your wife likes the Smashing Pumpkins. I'm sure she learned things about Billy on that videos that she did not know about him i've known the man seven years and every day i learned something new and that's the kind of connections that people are missing in their lives with even their closest people because we're so worried about what donald trump thinks Mm -hmm. and by the way it's important i'm not going to say it's not but donald trump is not is not in your house and i believe very strongly of taking care of your house first and that's like what you're creating for yourself and not what dolph ziggler is doing and i keep bringing up dolph because why not? You know, like <laughs> it doesn't matter what Dolph does or doesn't do or what they do with Dolph and not. If you're a content creator or if you're, you know, um, a person, that's, that's, that's who I want to work with. So, you know, I'm going down to WrestleMania to work with somebody, um, you know, to create content for them. And there's somebody that has a large history. And the point is, it's not just to create content that will drive subscribers. It's to give a deeper understanding to their impact on the business and then pivot it and, let them give back to those that are in the spots they're in now. And like, that's a story that doesn't get told. And, you know, there's the celebration of me, but what about us? So that's what I'm doing and how it affects wrestling. Um, there are too many 52 week a year pro wrestling products because now there's like, like, like flow slam and like literally Mm -hmm. there's probably Mm -hmm. wrestling happening right now somewhere live on the internet. And there's only so much you can focus on. So start smaller and focus on great stories and build on top of that. And, you know, does it scale? Yes. It scales when everybody's willing to put in the work and not wait around for somebody to pay you X to just show up somewhere because you got to put the work in every day for yourself. If you're a wrestler or content provider, because guess what? It's possible. It's possible using this camera, this camera, and this every minute of every day to be doing something interesting. And again, we've talked not once about one pro wrestling finish. Exactly. Exactly. The conversation I wanted to have with you today. Thank you so much at Lagana on the, uh, on the Twitters. Uh, where else can people find you online? Find out what you're, I'm on a Snapchat, but very boring DJ Lagana. The same with my Instagram DJ Lagana. If you're not really putting time into Instagram, you're, you're, you're missing out. I love Twitter. It's always, it's, you know, it's, it's my first love. It's where I have my, biggest following but it's to me it's it's become a jumbled mess and that's why i've been going back to more one-to-one on there um facebook i like to i will not add you on my personal facebook i have a facebook page which i shared um if you just look up i think it's david lagana writer it'll come up um so that's that's where i'm at and then but, but seriously my email is on my twitter my uh my dms are open anybody that has any question that wants to really have a serious discussion about, you know, their future, I want to have it. And that's the thing is, is I think too many people want to have discussions about the past. Let's talk about today and the future. Love it. 
Thank you so much. Uh, check out all the stuff he's working on. Thank you so much, longtime friend of the show. If you want to check out this, if you want to pack, uh, check out the past interview. I do have it linked over on the Wrestling Mayhem Show Facebook group when we announced this. Um, or just look for look up Dave Lagana at WrestlingMayhemShow.com to see how, how different this conversation is from then to now. I think it's been very interesting as both of us have been looking back at that as well. Um, check out everything at Indie, Indie Mayhem Show. Subscribe to us on iTunes, Stitcher, Spreaker, iHeartRadio, and uh, of course the video version on the Wrestling Mayhem Show Facebook and YouTube page, patreon.com slash Wrestling Mayhem Show to support this and support all of our friends over at IndieWrestling.us. Thank you so much to my guests and uh, you guys keep supporting indie wrestling out there. See you next time. This show is a member of the Sorgatron Media Podcast Network. Find out more at sorgatronmedia.com.